showtime. shooting in U.S. history. The politics made more people get hurt. When tragedies and calamities occur, we are often inundated by the news media 24-7. And then as suddenly as these stories appear, they seem to disappear and we move on with our lives. Tonight's guest, he couldn't do that. He couldn't just move on. Ramsey Dennison is a documentary filmmaker who uncovered another side to the story. The story of the worst mass shooting in the history of the country that took place on the Las Vegas Strip on that horrific day in October of 2017. Ramsey, welcome to the show and thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me. It's our pleasure. This is a really important story to tell and we understand that you shot this documentary based on this tragedy that happened in Las Vegas where 58 people lost their lives, over 800 people were injured. Now, there are many angles you could have taken with this story, gun violence, gun control, but you opted for a different angle. The title of the documentary is Money Machine. What is the significance of that title and how did you come to that perspective? Well, I came to that perspective because as I watched this unfold, um, it became very clear that there was one thing that was central to everything about this. There was one reason why the deadliest mass shooting in, the, in U.S. history became one of the most quickly forgotten, and that is money. And that is all Vegas is about. And <laughs> if you're ever looking for a question of why something happens in Vegas, it's almost always money. And um, the deadliest mass shooting in U.S. history was getting in the way of the cash. And so it had to get out of the way as fast as possible. And so as I really probed into um, and got behind the scenes and got the perspective of, you know, officers in the department and, and um, you know, I really kind of came to see that what this was really all about, you know, behind the platitudes and the, you know, the Vegas strong and all this kind of sentimental um, imagery that was like put up there, what it was, what really needed to happen was, this shooting needed to get off center stage so people could get back to Vegas and back to losing money. And that's it. And, um, and there was a lot of, um, and basically it all came down to that. Well, I just want to backtrack for a second because for those people who haven't seen the documentary, um, you, you met, you just alluded now to the, the police department and, and, and the, the town wanting to get back to it. Can you elaborate on that a little bit more? Right. So when this happened, when one October happened, almost immediately you saw the Vegas strong hashtag everywhere. And, and you know, Vegas strong this and there, and there became these big fundraisers. And, um, and it, it, it was an image thing, you know, they needed to make it look like Vegas cared about people. But the, the reality of the situation was that five months after Vegas strong, you know, over $10 million had been raised. And less than $20,000 of that money had actually made its way back to the victims. Less than 20. And so you had people losing their homes. You had people, you know, I talked to people who were having all kinds of financial difficulties and this money wasn't getting where it needed to be. And in my opinion, that was because it was never really about the victims. It was, it was an image thing. And um, even the police department was, was kind of part of making this disappear as fast as possible. One of the interesting perspectives I had having Money Machine is that I had relationships with seven, several like retired LBMPD officers within the department, and they were telling me what was really going on behind the scenes, and um, you know, and why things were really happening as opposed to the public image that was being presented to the public. And one of the things you notice real fast is that when this, when things started to get messy, when the narrative got a little messy, when the sheriff started looking bad on national TV. Um, they shut the press conferences down and the whole thing got shut down and all of a sudden 
the biggest story of the year became like a non-event. Um, and that was because they needed it to go away. I'll tell you, Ramsey, I'm, I'm really glad that, that you, you, you talked about it from that perspective, because one of the things that, that I wanted to, to share with you is, you know, sometimes there's an initial reaction to things. And I know when I first saw the trailer and I, I was really impressed with all of the people that you gained access to and that you were able to speak to, and we'll come back to that. But there was, and again, this was just my initial reaction. So I'm going to share that with you and then how I kind of evolved once I got to understand the entire situation uh, as you put everything together. And there was a lot of focus on the person and, and I don't, mention their names, the, 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 the shooter. I refuse to mention their names. That's a personal thing. Um, and it was all the things that had been done wrong to him or how he was screwed over by the casino and so on and so forth and how this built up and built up. And what I didn't see was anything really about him and what he had actually done. But then I came to realize the money machine and all the things behind it and all the things that happened before, during and after and what you just talked about in answering Rosie's question was just absolutely mind blowing to me. And, and I just had a new appreciation for the perspective that you took because like Rosie said, so many times when these things happen, people jump to like an issue, uh, a particular issue or a particular uh, angle that they already had in mind. Whereas you kept digging and you got so much deeper than anyone else could have. So I just, I just want to thank you for that. And like I said, first impressions aren't, all, aren't always the right ones. And I went back and looked at the trailer again after seeing uh, more of the film and hearing you talk more about it. And I just wanted to let you know that, that it was just, to me, it was just, just incredible work that you did. Thank you. I appreciate that. And, and I want to say that we didn't arrive at this conclusion instantly. You know, it wasn't called Money Machine from day one. Um, it was it was kind of a, you know, we started off the film trying to figure out this event and figure out what really happened. And originally we thought there might be multiple shooters and, you know, and we have that in the film, you know, because that's what we thought might've been the truth at that point. And it was really over time as things unfolded that we came to understand that there weren't multiple shooters um, and that the driving force behind this was really money. And we, we came to that conclusion when we interviewed Stephen Paddock's brother, Eric. And I mean, that was an unbelievable couple of hours that we spent with him. And, and I, I understand that people have the perspective of like not mentioning the shooter. And I, I understand and appreciate that. But at the same time, even monsters have motives. And there's nothing right about what he did, but there is a reason he did it. And um, I think that that needs to be put out there in the universe because I think MGM and the money, they didn't want that out there, that they're part of the reason why this happened, but the truth is the truth, you know? And the truth is that there is a lot of greed in Vegas and that, you know, and that MGM didn't exactly behave with the utmost integrity either. And so they kind of deserve um, for, for their, their role in this to, to be put out there in the universe, you know, that they did play a role in helping drive this to happen. And also that their security is another reason, one of the reasons why this happened. They, there was over 200 security cameras, surveillance cameras not working on the night of one October. And, um, you know, a lot of this stuff was kept on the down low. You know, they're protecting MGM, the, the most powerful corporation in Nevada with the most employees. And so there was really kind of a corporate cover up going on here. And, and a lot of MGM's negligence and incompetence was kind of swept under the rug because they're so powerful, because they're the biggest employer in the state of Nevada. When, well, first of all, the perspective that you got from uh, Stephen's brother, he seemed very eager to, to share that perspective, which surprised me. I mean, he was honest about the fact that, that his father was a bank robber and that this, his family is very dysfunctional and troubled. Eric's kind of hyper. So okay, maybe that's what it was. was eager, but he'd actually spent a lot of time turning people down. Um, before he did the interview with us. And he turned us down many times. And what happened is that our producer, Mike Turber, developed a relationship with him and, and, and he finally agreed to do the interview. And um, Eric is really an unfiltered guy. He's one of those people where when you talk to him, you, you're certain he's telling the truth because he just has very little patience for like BS. And um, so he comes, he, but yeah, he's just generally a very hyper person. So it could seem that way. But actually Eric, 
basically regards this whole thing as a nuisance that he wants to go away. Um, but he, he did take time to do the interview with us and what he laid out for us, I 100% believe. I mean, I think Eric, Eric's the one who knew Stephen better than anybody else in the world. And um, I believe what he said is by far the closest to the truth, far closer than MGM or any of the PR people um, will, will tell you. Because um, they, they have a reason for not wanting this information out. And that reason is because they're partly cold and why this happened. Yeah, and it's, it's, it gives credence, I think, to, uh, you know, that phrase a lot of times, it's not so much the crime, but the cover up and, and, you know, the things that go on. And, and I know you've talked about a lot of information that was withheld and things of that nature. But I, uh, two quick things. One, I want to give you credit for what you said before in terms of not going in with an agenda, not going in. You, you wanted to see what the story was to, before you told it, before you came up with the name. And what I'd like to do for our viewers right now is just take a moment and share the trailer to Money Machine with them right now. We are talking about the largest mass shooting in the history of the United States. This is a crazed lunatic. My brother just killed 58 people. My dad was on the 10 most wanted FBI list. We're not normal people. Ah! gambled $1.6 million at the Mandalay in the week before he did this. He was really, really angry with the gaming industry. There's been accusations that there's multiple shooters. That has been proven to be false. And you had politicians grandstanding on this Vegas Strong movement to get elected. Vegas Strong. I'm turning tragedy into opportunity. It was an election year, and it was camera time for Lombardo and his friends. I want to thank Sheriff Lombardo for your leadership. I'm getting faced up every day. Almost every press conference, you saw one figure, and that was Steve Sislak, using this as a springboard for his political campaign. We use the tragedy to get elected. While the hashtag Vegas Strong campaign raised over $10 million, less than $20,000 were distributed to the victims in the first five months. If they came out and said what really happened, I think they're afraid of a period of time where people say it's not safe to go to Vegas. Nothing happens in Las Vegas without the ring of a cash register. MGM Resorts is suing the victims. They are being sued for getting shot. Shameful, disgusting, outrageous. The newly released video shows Las Vegas police waiting in the hallway as Stephen Paddock continues to murder people. Oh my God. Lives could have been saved if they would have taken action. They were fibbing the whole time about being such big heroes they are hiding in the hallway. I asked them, are you stupid or are you incompetent? Please stop asking your question. You hear officers directly saying, turn your cameras off. I'm telling you right now there's more than one shooter. Could be as many as three. We saw multiple muzzle flashes coming out that window. There is no conspiracy. Can't trust it! Yeah, can't trust it! Ram, that was certainly provocative and filled with so many shocking revelations. When did you decide you wanted to do this story? Was it instantaneous when you heard about the tragedy? So I actually made a previous documentary called What Happened in Vegas, which is my first feature documentary. Mm -hmm. And that was about police corruption in the LVMPD. And that movie came out and, you know, played all over Vegas in 2017, got some awards and, and was well, pretty well known in Vegas. And because of that film, I developed relationships with former retired lieutenants and sergeants in the LVMPD. Um, you know, the movie was a pretty scathing, harrowing film about police corruption in the LVMPD. And I, I thought the reaction would the, the reaction was different from what I expected. I basically expected that anybody involved with the LBMPD would never want to talk to me or, or regard me as the enemy. And in fact, kind of the opposite happened. A lot of people realized that I was pointing out corruption that had ruined their once good police department. And so they became, they used to tell me, they'd say, the enemy of my enemy is my ally, you know? And so to them, the enemy was the corruption that had taken over the department because I was kind of pointing to that. I became somebody that they shared information with. So, um, and some of these officers, former officers are actually the people you see in the movie, um, Bobby Kinch, um, um, Monty. Um, so you have former LBMPD officers and they were the ones who were getting the inside information from the, in the department because of their access to the department and giving it to me 
And that's how I kind of figure out what was really going on behind the scenes instead of the public image of what was being presented. So Ramsey, when this happened though, did the idea for this film being a continuation of your first documentary, kind of, not exactly, but keeping to that, those lines, like to really look what the root cause of, of some of this would be, like the corruption, the greed. Did it come yeah, right, it did, right it away? Right away. I'll tell you that because I was still kind of like, as the guy who just made a documentary exposing corruption in Vegas, I wasn't really that in a hurry to get back to, you know, I felt kind of <laughs> in danger in Vegas. So it took me a little while to fully commit to this movie. And, I, and when I did so, I had to do so by be, like being very careful using rental cars and, and, you know, sunglasses and hats and, and trying to be as, move in and out of Vegas as discreetly as possible, no social media, et cetera, um, so we could get in there and get the real story. But it was it was something I had to think hard about because, um, and, and ultimately what happened was I thought that the story was so compelling because the truth was being hidden so much that somebody had to tell it. And so I kind of got roped in again to going back to Vegas who were you afraid of the most? I was afraid of the police department that I just exposed. Um, to be released. You know, and, and it's not not that I thought that they pulled, uh, pulled me over and killed me, but it, it's more that you think of, you know, you, you're rolling into this town, you've exposed this department, and all of a sudden you get pulled over, and, oh, what's that? Cocaine in his pocket? Oh, send this guy away for five, you know. Um, that may sound paranoid, but if you saw how... I mean, the movie did get out there and it did embarrass the department um, because it told the truth. And there's there was a lot of people who don't like that. And, you know, Vegas has a reputation for being a town where people sometimes end up in the desert. Um, and so so it was it was something I took seriously and um, didn't take lightly. And I tried to always travel with a friend. I have a friend who came along who's absolutely fearless. And he would, I knew that no matter what happened, he would roll the camera on it no matter what anybody did. So that helped. When this the money machine uh, came out and when, when people started seeing it and, and and you just talked about a lot of the process of, of making it and, and all that you went through in making it, what have been some of the reactions you've received thus far about the movie? I mean, extremely positive. Um, you know, we, we film threat, which is one of the leading independent film publications they gave the movie a 10 out of 10 they loved it Forbes did a great write-up on it um it's played at a lot of you know unfortunately COVID has taken out all the festivals but it's it got into a ton of them it's played it's it's the reaction especially from the survivors who feel kind of pushed aside has been huge um far more than happened on my first film so I would say generally speaking it's been very it's gotten out there pretty good Okay, now, Ramsey, one other thing I want to ask is, how can people see this movie? Well, Money Machine is coming to Video On Demand on October 1st, which is a three-year anniversary of the Vegas mass shooting. Um, and so they can see it pretty much anywhere, you know, in any of the VOD platforms, Amazon, iTunes, Google Play, wherever. Um, so, yeah, that, that, that will happen on October 1st. Very good. Well, we look forward to it. And Ramsey, we're going to take a quick break for our next segment, 60 Seconds with Coach Lombardi, when we come back more with Ramsey Dennison. Take it away, Coach. Thanks, guys. Coach Lombardi here, coming to you from smoky Los Angeles. Well, we're in our seventh month of the coronavirus pandemic lockdown, and I'm hearing from many of you that you've put on the COVID-19. It seems like gaining weight during this quarantine has been the case for a lot of people. So today I'm going to give you my secret tips to go from quarantine to quarantine. Tip number one, remove all processed foods from your diet. I know you've heard this before, but this time I really want you to do it and replace them with healthy alternatives. For example, Ditch the high sugar cereals, cookies, cakes, ice cream, and candy, and replace them with things like apples and almonds or a high protein cereal like Magic Spoon or Catalina Crunch. Those are two of my favorites. Um, ice creams, you can replace those with Halo Top and Lightened 
or Forte High Protein Gelato, really, really good stuff. Or maybe some chocolate, some dark chocolate that's at least 70% cacao. Tip number two, don't drink your calories. Now, I'm not a fan of regular sodas and juices because they're loaded with sugar and have very little nutritional return, if any. So it's always best to have water as your primary drink, and you should have at least 60 ounces a day. But if you want something that feels like a soda without all that unwanted sugar, have calorie-free flavored sparkling water. Here's a couple of my favorite ones. Tip number three, eat whole organic food three times a day on a daily basis. I know you know this, but now I'm going to teach you how to put your meals together. They should look like this. Depending on your weight, you want to eat about four to six ounces of protein, like free-range chicken, grass-finished bison, which is very low in saturated fat, by the way. It will not raise your cholesterol. Four egg whites plus one yolk. That's another example of a protein. Or four to six ounces of organic turkey or salmon. Now, to that, you're going to add two cups of steamed vegetables, any ones that you like, like maybe baked Brussels sprouts, broccoli, cauliflower, maybe a salad mixed organic lettuces, or any colorful veggie. You can also mix and match those. Then to those two things, you're going to add a healthy fat. You're going to take about two tablespoons of olive oil, maybe for a dressing, or you're going to add a quarter of an avocado, maybe 10 olives, or one ounce of whole fat cheese. And the fourth ingredient you're going to add to your meal is a healthy carbohydrate. For example, half a baked sweet potato or yam, or maybe one slice of my favorite Udi's gluten-free bread, or a half a cup of blueberries, strawberries, or raspberries, or a half a cup of brown or white rice. Those are good examples of complex carbohydrates. Tip number four, commit to walking. Walk outside or on a treadmill for three to six miles per day or 10,000 steps total for the whole day, which would include your daily activity as well in that total number. So that would be your daily activity in the house plus the structured walking that you do, equaling 10,000 steps a day. If you do these four tips starting today, you're going to see results immediately. Also, don't forget to send your questions to me to the email below. I'm Coach Lombardi for The Rosie and Bill Show. All right. Thanks, Coach. Another great tip. Looking forward to seeing what you have for us next week. Now, Ramsey, I want to shift gears just a little bit and kind of travel back a little bit in time because I read something about you that really impressed me. And it was, you finished, see if I got this right, you graduated 212th in your high school class. And you've, you've had to have be doggedly determined and work harder than a lot of other people to get to where you are. You just, you've got no quit in you. You're, you're, you know, here in Philly, we've got the Rocky Balboa story, okay? We love the underdog. We love people that work hard, and I especially do. And that sounds like you. So I have to ask, where'd you get your motor from? How did you keep going and just keep fighting and clawing to get to where you are? Yeah, well, I mean, one of the reasons I graduated 200 talk in my class is because I wasn't interested in, um, <laughs> particularly in school. Um, you know, there was no video classes or anything. So I, I but I, I was fascinated by film um, from a pretty young age. And so, well, in my English classes and stuff, I was reading books, you know, the five C's of cinematography and, and reading scripts for like Kramer versus Kramer or something like, like I was, so I was absolutely riveted by film and television from a young age, but I wasn't riveted by uh, <laughs> any of the stuff they're teaching me about school. So I was not a good student. Um, and, uh, but, but after I finished, you know, when I was 17, I got a job at a community college TV station in Florida called WBCC TV 68, just a little station where they put, I put telecourses on the air, you know, like they have classes that you'd watch online, like geography 102. Um, and so I was just the guy who put those on the air. And then I, but I was there at night, but no one else was there. And I started messing around with the equipment and making movies. And, uh, that's how it really started for me was when I was 17 years old. And then um, I, I just was pretty single-minded um, in, in studying film. I, you know, I've, I've read hundreds of books and, and um, spent a lot of time just, like, really learning and loving the craft. And then when I moved out to L.A., um, 
I started working in behind the scenes documentaries, you know, and so I just, I realized that I love documentaries far more than the narrative, that I'll enjoy the process more. So that's kind of how I got in. It's important work really to have someone to tell sides of the story, these true life stories that we don't normally get. So thank you for the decision you made <laughs> because there are plenty of, plenty of narratives out there. So we need good documentary filmmakers. But speaking of, well, first of all, what is your favorite documentary other than your own? Do you have a favorite? Well, my own is not my favorite. <laughs> I always liked Roger and Me. I always thought that that movie was absolutely incredible. Um, I also thought O.J. Made in America was probably one of the finest things I've ever seen. But just astounding. I would, I would, I would throw those two out there. Um, Roger and Me was terrific. I mean, that was Michael Moore's first movie. And it was just so unbelievable that this guy from Flint, Michigan, could make something with that kind of power that would ultimately, like, expose GM. I mean, it was just on, you know. So Michael Moore has gotten a lot of praise and a lot of criticism, but he's, he's pretty darn good at what he does. Would you say he's one of your influences? Yeah, absolutely. Not, not so much as politics as much as just his... He's just a very unpretentious filmmaker. I mean, his movies have a lot of humor in them. They're very kind of uh, down to earth. And um, there's there's nothing snooty about Michael Moore. He makes accessible movies, and he, he, he's not part of the – I mean, there's just a lot to like there. Now, I understand, Ramsey, that you just uh, signed a deal with Submarine Entertainment. Can you tell yeah. us what that means for the movie, what that means for you personally? Yeah, so Submarine is one of the leading sales agents for um, – documentaries um they've had multiple academy award winners so basically they're like an agent for your film um meaning they they take it out to distributors and um they basically become like an agent for your film so getting submarine to sign on board was fantastic um you know they don't they, it's hard to get someone of their clout to do that so we we definitely are really happy to be um you know fortunate enough to be in business with the best in the business so very excited about that Congratulations. Now, there's one other thing we wanted to bring up, Ram, and that is uh, someone that maybe you might want to pay a little tribute to. We understand that you lost a very dear friend and one of your cameramen just a couple of days ago, your friend Daniel. Yeah. Daniel Apodaco was this incredible kid. Um, and I say kid because he died when he was 27. And I first met Daniel when he was in his early 20s. He was, um, even then when he was like 20, 21, he was working on professional film sets. Um, just, he was that kid who was always hustling, um, like meaning like on the film set, running around, putting up lights. Terrific, terrific kid. And I hired him. He did the camera work for my first film, What Happened in Vegas. And uh, Daniel was a scrappy kid. He, uh, you know, he came from a lower class background and, and he applied to, UCLA film school, which is probably the hardest to get into in the country. Maybe one in a hundred people get in and Dana got rejected four times. And then on his fifth try, he got in. And um, that was right around the time that he finished being a, uh, you know, doing his camera work for my first movie, what happened in Vegas. And so he was all excited to sign up and, you know, to be part of the UCLA, you know, on his fifth try, he'd finally gotten in and we we're all happy for him. And then almost immediately he get he gets cancer. And, um, He's had a he had a three year struggle with it, fought it hard with grace and dignity, and then um, on August fifth it did it, it took him. So very sad, but um, you know, I it, I'm, I'm I'm happy that I at least got to work with him. It sounds like he packed a lot in in such a short young life, and uh, I'm grateful that he was able to realize his dream of getting into film school. That's the bright side in in yeah. a tragic story. Yeah. He's, uh, you know, and the one thing about Daniel is he, he always handled it with such grace. Like, I remember he showed up in the Q&A at our L.A. premiere, and, and, I mean, he'd just been diagnosed and stuff, and he never wanted any sympathy. He was always smiling in photos, and it's just, you know, to be a kid in your early 20s and be going through that and to smile every step of the way, it's just unbelievable. He was something special. He definitely sounds inspirational. I thank you so much for, for sharing that uh, story and, and, and your thoughts about Daniel. And again, all, all our best and thoughts and prayers with you and his family on that loss. And like Rosie said, it sounds like he, he made a real difference uh, in the lives of so many 
as you have too as well. And I'm sure that you're going to continue to do that in the future. So thank you so much for joining us tonight on our show. We really appreciate thank it. You. Thanks for having me. Yes. Again, it's our pleasure. And we look forward to whatever new things you have on the horizon. And we'll have to have you back the next time when you have. Thanks, Rosie. Thanks, Bill. I appreciate it. Well, folks, as Ram has done, make a difference for someone every day. And make every day a great day. Thank you so much for tuning in, and we'll see you next week.